Welcome. Welcome, I'm Doug Sesserman and it's hashtag Webinar Wednesday. Today we have a very special program for you. And first I just wanna acknowledge our colleagues at Bangarine University Canada for producing that really impactful video. It is noon Eastern time. I'm speaking to you from my virtual office in New York City. It's 7 p.m. Uh, in Israel. Today we are joined by Professor Yonatan Mendel from BGU's Department of Middle East Studies on a topic called Gaza 101, before and after October 7th. I just wanted to begin with a quote from David Ben-Gurion, our founder and first prime minister, who once said that it is in the Negev in the South that are the cradle of our people. There are the country's weak points, challenges, and danger zones, and it is in the Negev that the people of Israel will be tested. What a profoundly prophetic statement that appears today, obviously. However, David Ben-Gurion also said that the South represents the country's greatest hope, as it is from the Negev where the future of Israel will emerge. So hopefully after today's webinar, you'll feel more educated um, and also hopeful that we can find a way to brighter days ahead. The numbers that were presented in the video were recent, but unfortunately not fully updated. So I just wanted to inform you that as of this week, we now have 111 dead, unfortunately, as part of BGU's community. I'm talking about fallen soldiers, students, faculties, first degree family members, and alumni who were murdered on October 7th and fallen since. 29 wounded, four missing, still kidnapped, including the face of the hostage crisis, Noah Argamani, who is a BGU 26-year-old student who was forcibly separated from her boyfriend, Avi Natan Orr, also a BGU alum, at the Nova Music Festival. We wish for their speedy recovery. Of the 1,182 of you that have joined us today, 579 are brand new. That's close to 50%. So thank you for joining this program. I also just want to acknowledge that we had more than 6,600 6, students and faculty that got called up to Milloween or reserve duty in the IDF, and 2,100 are still serving. So today's webinar features Ben Gurion University professor Yonatan Mendel of the Department of Middle East Studies. He's a leading scholar of the Middle East and teaches the only academic course in any Israeli university, specifically on the topic of Gaza. It's entitled Gaza, History, Society, Culture, and Politics. And Yoni has been teaching this course since 2019. We are all fortunate today to be his next students for the next 40 minutes as he shares background on Gaza to help us understand how we got to this place and where we might be going. Before we begin, I also just want to thank the Americans for Ben Gurion University team behind the scenes that helped to produce this important webinar, Lenore Levine, Cheryl Corlitz, and Blair Kahana. And to those who are joining us for the very first time, it's important to understand the Zoom instructions. So if you have a question, just click on the Q&A function throughout the program, and I'll do my best to get these questions to Yoni, especially toward the end of the program. So now let's get going. A quick bio on Yoni. Professor Yonatan Mendel is an associate professor in the Department of Middle East Studies at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, where he heads the Arabic Language and Culture Division. Yoni speaks Hebrew, Arabic, and English, and his main research interests are the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and language policy in Israel. Mendel is also a translator and serves as the associate editor of Maktoub, a unique book series dedicated to the translation of Arab li Ar Arabic literature into Hebrew. He has written extensively about Israeli society and politics and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. His articles have appeared in Haaretz, the London Review of Books, and Le Monde Diplomatique, as well as other publications. 
Yoni received his bachelor's degree in Middle East Studies and Political Science from Tel Aviv University. He has a master's degree from the University of London and received his PhD at Cambridge. Professor Mendel did two postdocs, one at Ben Gurion University and another at the Hebrew University before being recruited as a part of our faculty in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Professor Yonatan Mendel to hashtag Webinar Wednesday. Thank you, Yoni. Thank you very much, Doug, for hosting me. I thank, thank all of you and thanks everybody at home who are listening to us. Uh, that's a great honor and that's a, a, a great or an important occasion also and obviously an important topic because it's not only one that is related to Be'er Sheva and Ben Gurion, but also to current politics and the current situation and also to the future of Israel and uh, obviously has uh, implication on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as well. Should I, uh, Doug, just start? Yes? Yes, yes, Yoni. Why don't we start with a little bit of your presentation? You have some PowerPoint slides and a little teaching, and then we'll go to the questions from the audience. Okay, good. So um, I, I will use the next 15 minutes, Doug, is this fine? The next 15 minutes to do um, the PowerPoint presentation and also a few things that I wanted to say about BGU and in the course about Gaza. First, following the videos that we've just seen, I must say as a professor, as a, as a, as a lecturer at the, at the university, the last semester, the current semester is a very sad one. Many times I see many students, but I don't hear many students. So the feeling is that there is a, I don't know, it, it, it's an ongoing tragedy. And obviously this is uh, something that is very much felt. And we as faculty members, we are doing our best to, to keep on teaching, even though the, the, the situation is so very bad and so very sad. Uh, about the course about Gaza, so as you said uh, before, there is a course about Gaza that we are teaching it already for the fifth year in a row, and I'm teaching it with my colleague, Dr. Dutana Levy, and it all started five years ago after I, I, I got accepted to the Department of Middle Eastern Studies, and Professor Avi Rubin, who at the time was the head of the department, asked me if I would like to teach a course that is not on my specific expertise, which is Arabic studies, Arabic and language policy. And I told him if I have to choose one course, it will be about Gaza. And he asked me why about Gaza, and I said that Gaza seems to be like the closest and also the most far away place to Be'er Sheva. It is very close. They had good connections. Obviously, before 1948, Gaza and Be'er Sheva were part of the same region and also had different interactions. But today, especially over the last 20 years, Gaza is in the south, but it is almost beyond reach. And people in Israel and students in Ben Gurion and students in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies, the only thing they know about Gaza is that rockets are being fired from Gaza. And I told them that Gaza seems to be like a blind spot of Israeli politics and that we have to push forward a course that will be specifically about that. What is Gaza? why Gaza is called the Gaza Strip, who lives in Gaza, and why Gaza keeps on from 1948 up until today, as I will explain today very briefly, was both a blind spot of Israeli politics and Israeli decision-making, but also was a microcosmos of a very strange central uh, 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 um, component of Palestinian politics. So I will start with this PowerPoint, I'll do share screen. I hope everything will go well. Um, oh, sorry about this. Can you see this now? Yes, just, okay. So I'm starting with this saying Gaza as an Israeli uh, blind spot, as an Israeli blind spot, and I start with two images from Gaza, one from the Gazan beach. Many times when I show it to my students, they start and say, isn't it in Jaffa or Tel Aviv? And I think that many times people, it's very hard for them even to imagine people going to the beach in Gaza. And the picture uh, underneath, which is of the Hamas uh, speaker, Abu Abeda, which is the current uh, most, uh, I don't know, one of the most uh, well-known people shown in international television, especially after the October 7 horrific uh, uh, attack. The next one is just to show you where Ben Gurion University is and how close it is to the Gaza Strip. And also it can exemplify how close Gaza is, but also how small uh, Gaza is, and I will show, I will have another map coming on now. About Gaza. So first, 
and and we do it obviously very very briefly and in the course we dedicated uh, this is dr dotana levy and myself we co-teach this course together so there are a few points that are very much important to mention for anyone who wants to understand what's going on what's going on in gaza before october 7 and what's going on also in gaza from october 7 onwards uh, uh, and, and still ongoing so firstly, we all know the term, the Gaza Strip. And the, it is important to mention that the Gaza Strip is a new invention. Gaza Strip never, uh, uh, never existed before 1948. And it is the outcome of two different processes. Um, one process is obviously the war. So the Gaza Strip was supposed to be part of the Arab state, according to the partition plan. It was bigger, and also the West Bank was still, uh, 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 relatively bigger, and also the Galilee was part of the separation, or uh, was part of the Arab state in the partition plan. Anyway, following the war of 1948, the Gaza Strip was shrinked to what we currently know it as the Gaza Strip, and it was changed both geographically but also demographically. And the most in important thing demographically, and this is something that keeps on being so very central in the Gaza Strip up until today, that if we look at the Israeli shore or Palestinian view, the Palestinian or the Eretz Israeli shore, mandatory Palestine shore, we will see all, all the way from the north to the south that there used to be Arab cities like Acre, like Jaffa, like Alid, Ramle, and so on and so forth, that were almost all emptied of their Arab citizens during the war due to different reasons. The only city that is on the shore, that not only that got smaller, but got bigger and, 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 and very seriously so, is Gaza. Before 1948, we speak about a region, what is today the Gaza Strip, of about 60,000, 70,000 people. After the war in Gaza, there are about 280,000 people, which means that if the Palestinian refugee problem that starts in 1948 includes about 700,000 people who were uprooted from their homes, and this is obviously a political, pro a political question, what exactly happened and were they uprooted because of only Israel or also because of self-decision or you know the, the, the ongoing debate about the Palestinian refugee problem. But one important thing is that out of 700,000 people who were uprooted from their homes, who left their homes, almost a third reached the Gaza Strip, which means that the Gaza Strip from the very beginning of its creation was part and parcel and the most central reflection of the Palestinian refugees prob refugee problem. And this is something that keeps on being all the way until today. From 1948 to 1967, and obviously we go rather quickly because, uh, uh, because of the lack of time, uh, the, the Gaza Strip was under Egyptian control. And it was not under Egyptian civilian control, but under Egyptian military control which means that the, uh, there was a military regime in the Gaza Strip. The Palestinians in Gaza never received an, Egypt, an Egyptian citizenship due to several reasons. But one important thing is that at that time, Gaza was not part of, was not occupied or was not controlled by Israel, but by the Egyptians. In 1967, following the 1967 war known in Arabic as the Naqsa, following the occupation of, and, and, and later also annexation of different parts. Uh, East Jerusalem was annexed to Israel, the Golan Heights was annexed to Israel, but the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and Sinai Desert that were occupied were not annexed to Israel. But Gaza became now military controlled by Israel. So it changed hands from the Ottomans up until 1918 to the Brits from 1920 to 1948, to the Egyptians from 1948 to 67, uh, uh, when Israel took control or occupied the, the Gaza Strip. And this last until 1987, or at least one important period, is between 1967 and 1987. What is important for me to mention 
about this period, that Israel controls the Gaza Strip, and there are more and more Palestinians from Gaza who move to work from the Gaza Strip into Israel, and there are many Israelis who go and do their shopping or do other things in Gaza. So this is a time that obviously that Palestinians do not fulfill their national aspirations, which are different. They are related to the refugees, to Palestinian state, to uh, uh, different other, other issues. But the relations between Israelis and Gazans are at least ones that the people do know each other, which is something that changed dramatically over the last 20 years, in which Israelis do not meet Gazans and Gazans do not, do not meet Israelis. And I think that this is something that have repercussions and consequences also on the way that each side can dehumanize uh, the other side. But this is one important period, 67 to 87. It is very much also related to the Palestinian refugee problem and to the Palestinian dream about return. Imagine that if th three out of four Palestinians in Gaza is a refugee, which means that his parents or grandparents are originally from Lid, Jaffa, Ramle, Simsim, Brir, Mjedel, Askilan, Ashdod, and so many other, Isdud, and so many other places. Each time that they went to work from the Gaza Strip into one of the construction sites or agriculture in Israel, they had also something planted in them, which was the dream about return as they passed through places that they used to live up until 1948. 1987 is a very important year, and I will then later also mention uh, again or summarize the central role of Gaza in each of these uh, 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 issues, because in 1987, the Palestinian Intifada erupts. Uh, intifada also could mean awakening, or uh, well, I think awakening will be the best in English. And it erupts, important to say, in Gaza. It erupts in a refugee camp, it's called Jebalia, one of seven refugee camps in the Gaza Strip. It erupts in December 1987. And this is from this, from there, the Intifada uh, spreads also to the West Bank. But it is important to mention the central role of Gaza in the first Intifada. And this is following that Intifada that Hamas, that we currently hear a lot about, uh, uh, had, was created. Hamas was created in 1987. Up until 1987, there was not a movement called Hamas. There was an Islamic-oriented association that was called Al-Mujamma al-Islami that Israel, for different reasons, saw as a counterforce to Fatah in the PLO. And anyway, from 1987, this is the movement that, that was then titled Hamas and is still known today was titled, and Hamas stands for Harakat al mukawam al Islamiya, the Islamic resistant movement. So again, it is important to highlight the central role of Gaza, not only as the place from which the Intifada began, but also the place from which Hamas grew up, or was, was born, or was created. 1987 to 2007, and again, I, as I said before, it, it's hard, but I'm trying to shrink a course of 13 uh, weeks to uh, 15 minutes. But an, another period that we call a, the long disengagement begins. And this is where Gaza starts also to play a role in the political, let's say, solution or resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, at least in some people's eyes. Uh, it starts in 1980, sorry, 1991. Um, perhaps some of you know that before the Oslo Accords were signed in 1993, there was another important uh, agreement that is called the Madrid Agreement or the Madrid Accord, uh, or at least the Madrid uh, Conference. It was the first time that Israeli leaders and Palestinian leaders met. At the time, the, the meeting was not direct. The Palestinian team was part of the Jordanian team, who met in Jordan in order to discuss the future of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and hopefully its resolution. For us, important to mention that the Palestinian team was headed by Gazan intellectual called Haider Abdel 1993, back in the United States of America, on the loans of the White House, the Oslo Accords uh, were signed. Uh, Bill Clinton was the president of the, of, of the USA. It's Hak Rabin was a 
Prime Minister of Israel, and Yasser Arafat was the, the chairman of the PLO. This was the first time ever that an Israeli leader shook the hand publicly of the PLO leader. For us, important to mention, first, that the idea of the Oslo Accords was that the Palestinian will receive some autonomy, and the plan was called Gaza and Jericho first. And Gaza was, by all means, the, the first place in which the Oslo Accords were um, implemented. Also important to mention that when Yasser Arafat goes back from Tunis, Tunisia to mandatory Palestine, Israel, the Palestinian territories, he decides to, 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 to put his headquarters on the seashore in Gaza, and Yasser Arafat himself is also of a Gazan family, his son of a, of a Khan Yunis a merchant from El Kidwa family. Many other Palestinian uh, leaders as well are from Gaza. The disengagement plan that took place about 30 years, uh, oh, sorry, 10 years after the Oslo Accords happened in 2005. The Prime Minister, the Israeli Prime Minister of, at the time was Ariel Sharon, and the decision was, again, with relation to the United States of America and George Bush uh, 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 roadmap, that Israel will do something in order to push forward, or at least to show that it is willing to go one step forward uh, uh, in relation to the roadmap, and Israel decides to disengage from Gaza unilaterally, and this is what happened in 2005. The year after, 2006, the Palestinians went for general election. This was the last time that Palestinians in the West Bank, in Gaza, and in East Jerusalem went to the ballot boxes. This means that already for 18 years, there were no elections in the Palestinian uh, territories. At that election in 2006, Hamas won it did not win the majority of the seats, but it won about 44% of the seats, and it allowed Hamas to be the bigger political party in Palestinian politics and to claim the leadership of the, Palest of, of the Palestinians. What happened next is a rivalry and fights between Hamas and Fatah. The, this happens in the West Bank and in Gaza Strip, and from 2007 and on, Hamas took over the Gaza Strip, Fatah took over the West Bank, and this is the, how to call it, I don't know how to call that term in chess, when nobody can move, but this is that, that uh, uh, mate maybe, no, but, Tell okay, me. never mind. Tell me. <laughs> so, the, no, so this is our stalemate. So this is a statement that still happened from 2007 up until today. This means that, for example, Palestinian leader, uh, Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, the chairman of the Palestine PLO, did not visit Gaza for the last 17 years, and uh, Hamas leaders from the Gaza Strip were not able to visit the West Bank. An idea of separation between the West Bank and Gaza Strip uh, uh, became more and more not popular, but more and more well-known, and what can be called the siege of Israel, and also Egypt took part in it, in Gaza began, in which we had rounds of violence over and over and over again, one in 2008, one in 2011, another in 2014, another in 2018, another in 2021, and the last one that began in the October 7th, that was the most lethal one and the most horrific one, uh, which also brought the biggest damage on the Gaza Strip that today, I think five months after the beginning of, of October 7th, there are about 1,500 and more of Israelis that were killed and more than 30,000 uh, Palestinians in Gaza that were killed. If I can... I'm not concluding yet because I have a few. How, do I have five more minutes, Doug? Take your five minutes. There, the questions are pouring in, so we need to get okay. through. Uh, so first, I think it is important to mention or to take from this talk three main topics. First, that Gaza is a symbol, whether we like it or not. Gaza was a symbol of Palestinian refugee problem. Gaza was a symbol of the Palestinian dream about return. Gaza was a symbol of resistance, 1987, 
the, the creation of Hamas, and, and, and Gaza was also a symbol of different other core issues of the Palestinian cause, including also resolution of, this, of, the, of the conflict with Israel. Secondly, Gaza, Gaza is part of Palestinian politics and society. And I don't say this in relation to October 7, I say it generally. Gaza, as I see it, cannot be a place, a territory that is being solved or that is being treated separately or in separation with the general Palestinian cause or with the general Palestinian question or with the general Palestinian problem. Third, there are several Israeli conceptions on Gaza that were present and that I will say have to be challenged, especially if we worry or if we would like to make sure that the people of Israel, people living in the south of Israel, bordering Gaza, will be able one day to live peacefully and, and, and with security. One of the most important conceptions was that Israel will be able to manage or administer the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Another concept was that maybe the people in Gaza will one day topple Hamas. I think this was a non-option. Another conception was that maybe one day Hamas will say, okay, actually we have enough in the Gaza Strip and we don't we are happy with being the mayors of, of Gaza and, and, and focusing on, on antiquities and, uh, and, and, and interior and interior uh, issues. This was also not going to happen. I think the idea of Israel signing different peace agreements with countries that are not the Palestinian leadership helped us maybe dream about a situation in which we create a peaceful environment in the Middle East without reaching a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. More and more, and I try to push forward this idea also when, I don't know, in different articles that I write, that we have to be able to focus and to deal directly with the core issues of the conflict and not to give a blind eye to them. I will end with the last slide that I think can show a few things. First, you can show, see how small Gaza is. Gaza makes about 1% of the total uh, area of Israel and the Palestinian territories. And this is very small area, as I say, 1.2% of the total area, but still one that represents many, many different issues vis-a-vis -vis Israel and Palestine. It represents the refugee problem, the right of return in Palestinian uh, terminology, prisoners, Jerusalem, uh, refugees, we said, the settlement of the project, sovereignty, state, and so on and so forth. So many places, so many different issues that are uh, focused on one small area, which means also, and many people, many researchers have said it, that Gaza is almost a microcosmos of the Palestinian cause. One will argue that being able to solve this area will be able also to show the way forward to a general or a better relations between Israelis and Palestinians. There are 2.3 million people who live in Gaza. 75% of these people are recognized as refugees according to the UN. It means that about 1.6 million people in Gaza, one of the most populated places in the world, are being dependent on support, education, medical treatment, ingredients like oil and sugar that are being given by the UN. I think that this situation has to end. It has to end because we have to find a solution to the ongoing open questions in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But it's not only about poverty or about, I don't know, statelessness or about other issues. It's also about what happened in Gaza over the last 20 years. And in Gaza, as you can see, the median age is 19. If we go 19 years back, we reach 2005. This means 2005, as I said before, this is a year of the disengagement. It means that half of the population of Gaza 
about 1.1 .1 million or 1.2 million has only experienced the reality that we have seen in that place over the last two decades. They have only experienced Hamas. They have only experienced that uh, 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 area in between Bet Lahiyya and Rafah, which is a very, very small area. And they have only experienced living under Hamas that is living under the Israeli-Egyptian siege. It means that they have never been, they have never seen, for example, Jewish Israelis, a proper dehumanization and uh, how can one start even to uh, not not explain, but I know try to uh, I, I'm missing that word, but try to to make something of October seventh. I think that we need to focus on the total dehumanization that exists, especially or if one would like from the Gaza uh, from the Gaza Strip into Israel, but also to the fact that Israelis also did not meet Gazans. All in all, and I will finish with this sentence, I have a feeling that Be'er Sheva and Ben Gurion universities that are located in the South have to be also a place in which some kind of a promise will come. And in the course about Gaza, and generally when speaking about this topic with our students, we try to think about a different future in which the people of Be'er Sheva and the students from Ben Gurion University are getting to know the Gaza Strip not through military operation and not through the shooting of Qassams from Gaza Strip to Be'er Sheva. One way to do that is to be more courageous and not to rely on military solutions only. Because as I said, technological and security oriented solutions are very limited in being able to secure and to, to give and to promise long-term security, let alone peace. So this was my 20 minutes or maybe a bit more. I'm sorry if I took longer. Okay, so uh, Yoni, leave that slide up there for a second. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and then we'll go into, uh, you'll stop share on the slides and we'll just have a discussion. That There are a lot of questions coming in. And for the audience, just remember, click on the Q&A function if you have a question. While this webinar was called for 45 minutes, that's about 10 minutes from now, we'll probably stretch it um, to, to 1 p.m. Eastern time. So just to get through the number of questions that are building. And we still have a very, very strong audience. Over 500 people are, are still with us. Okay, so when looking at this map, Yoni, uh, you can see the proximity of Gaza to the West Bank and Beersheba basically is right there in, in between. Could you just comment a little bit on the prospect really for a Palestinian state, a contiguous Palestinian state that would connect Gaza with the best, with the West Bank at some point in the future? Well, you are starting to get into the million dollars questions, or meaning like, what about the day after? How can we make sure that another October 7 will never happen again? And I think that one important thing that has to be said is that between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, there is no current road. And, uh, uh, and Israel believes that it's for its own security interest that there will be no connection between these two areas. And that actually, um, we have a few quotes about it and a few, I mean, I mean, a few proofs for it, that Israel was in a way happy with the fact that Palestinians in the Gaza Strip are ruled by Hamas, that Palestinians in the West Bank are ruled by Fatah, that Fatah and the West Bank are not, Fatah and, the Gaza, Fatah and Hamas do not speak with one another, and that there is total separation between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. This allowed Israel, and some leaders in Israel were happy with the fact that there are no negotiation whatsoever with the Palestinian uh, uh, leadership to continue on the situation as is without negotiation or without moving forward, because they said there is no one to speak with, because Hamas are terrorists, and because the, the West Bank do not, or Fatah, are not responsible for Hamas or so on and so forth. I think that if we want to imagine 
a different situation. We will have to remember that the Gaza Strip is the West Bank exit to the sea or to the world. And uh, while I understand the security issue with connecting the Gaza Strip to the West Bank, I think that the bigger security risk is keeping these two areas separated. Because keeping these two areas separated makes it very, very hard to imagine some kind of a Palestinian state. Um, okay. Some people say that also a Palestinian state should not be in the vision or should not be the goal of anyone who lives in Israel, and we should think about other solutions. Uh, I think that it is hard to speak about these things today as we are still under the shock of October 7, and it's still very difficult to understand what's going to happen, what's going to happen in the south of Lebanon and the north of Israel, and where are we heading? But at the end of the day, in between, or oh, if we look at this map, by the way, I, I took it from ABC, I see that the Golan Heights is not there, but it should be there. But if we look at this area, we have to acknowledge the fact that now between the Jordan River and the sea, there are more than 14 million people who live there, Jews and Arabs, Palestinians and Israelis. But the, 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 the percentage of the Jews is no longer the majority. Uh, Jews make about 48 or 49 percent of the population in between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. I think that the creation of a Palestinian state and finding a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not a Palestinian interest only. It should be an Israeli interest only. So we will not find ourselves in a situation that Israel controls the whole area in which there are a majority of Palestinians. Okay, thank you, Yoni. We're gonna, uh, you can stop share on the screen and we're gonna try to get moved to some questions of which we have many. Okay, so one question came in a little bit earlier in the talk, but I wanted just to bring it up from Gloria Blumenthal. She was asking, uh, pre-1948, were there Jews living in Gaza? Uh, uh, actually, pre-1929, there were Jews living in Gaza. Uh, the 1929, known as Hebrew as Meora uh, the 1929 events in Arabic, it's called Al-Burak uh, 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 Rising or awake, Awakening Thawrat Al-Burak. Uh, but the history of Jews in Gaza goes back even further to the 18th century and 17th century. So Gaza was populated mostly by Arab Muslims, but was there was a Jewish community there. One of the most famous rabbis uh, called Rabbi Israel Najara, uh, 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 Rabbi uh, uh, Ribon Olam, uh, was there, and there was always a small Jewish community in Gaza, and there is a Jewish cemetery in Gaza, obviously now, I don't know what, what, what is kept there. From 1929 onward, there were no Jews living in Gaza, obviously in the 1970s and 80s, following uh, the creation of Gush Emunim and the other settlements, and Jewish Hit Yashbuyot and Hit Nachluyot, in the, in the West Bank, there were also a few in the Gaza Strip, and the whole idea about the disengagement plan was to disengage, meaning to evacuate all Israeli settlements or all Israeli uh, 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 Jews uh, from the Gaza Strip. There were about 7,000 or 8,000 Jews living in Gaza in these settlements out of a population of 1.5 million uh, Palestinians at the time, 2005. We're Thank you. We're getting a question from Eva Kleiderman, and she's asking what what separates Hamas and Fatah philosophically from each other? Well, first, what brings them together is that they have also at times similar national aspirations. Uh, they they both speak about Jerusalem. When they speak about Jerusalem, they speak about Al-Aqsa Mosque as the capital of Israel, or sorry, as the capital of a future Palestinian state. They speak about uh, uh, the creation of a Palestinian state, uh, and then they kind of uh, uh, disagree about the borders of that state. What separates between them is that Hamas generally is an Islamic movement, or it is a Palestinian and Islamic movement, while Fatah is considered to be secular as much as uh, 
uh, it's not about the secularism, but it's not an uh, uh, Islamic uh, religious party as Hamas. Hamas is also uh, has a stronger or more rigid or less compromising view about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And while, while Fatah is committed to the two states solution and to the partition to two states on the 67 line, it was always very difficult to Hamas to acknowledge it directly. And they find all kinds of indirect ways to say that if this happens, so this will happen only for a period of 30 years and the next generation would be would decide whether there will be peace or not. I think that the uh, military wing of Hamas, it is called the Zadin al-Qassam, is the most lethal, uh, as we can see also in October 7. So they also uh, uh, are different in, in that respect. Um, it's very hard to speak now about Hamas in terms that are not related specifically to the horror and terror that we've all witnessed. Uh, yet from 1987 up until 2000, and 24 now, there were different phases in which different people and experts were saying that maybe there is a way to negotiate with the PLO and to bring Hamas in uh, into that uh, negotiations. I think this this was a discussion of its own. You mentioned that uh, that Gaza was part of Egypt from 48 to 67, uh, and then there was the 20 years until 87, and in 87, Hamas uh, was really created. I believe its first charter happened in 1988, one year later. Uh, then the charter was revised in 2017. Could you just speak to the differences, if any, in the doctrine of Hamas that changed from 88 to 2017? Well, the one for 1987, 1988 was, was straightforwardly a very extreme, rigid, uh, uh, one would argue also, you know, the, the, the discussion or the, the, the mentioning was about Jews and, and rejection of Jewish presence. Uh, and there was no separation whatsoever or no recognition whatsoever of, I don't know, um, of, um, I don't know, any way forward. It was very, very rigid. Uh, the one that you, you just mentioned was different. And there were different experts who were saying that this means that maybe this is like a way of Hamas to signal that it is willing to consider different solution. Um, I think this is kind of, it's a larger topic of one that we can elaborate about now. But over the years, and, the, and, and again, from 1987 onward, and different research was also about it. And in Israel, there are two famous researchers, Professor Abraham Sela from the Hebrew University and Professor Shaul Mishal from Tel Aviv University, who argued in the 1990s that Hamas has to be in, dealt with differently. They called their book Violence and Coexistence, meaning that Hamas is like operating in two different poles. It was also uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell who said that ignoring Hamas is not the way forward and Hamas must be engaged. This by no means means that one can understand, justify, explain, uh, you know, uh, any of that on, of, of the horrific scenes and massacres of October 7. It just means that we cannot ignore the fact that Hamas grew up from the refugee camps in Gaza and is connected to the Palestinian cause. And I don't think that Hamas is also a movement that can be annihilated or, 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 or destroyed, especially because it also it is connected to other issues which are not terroristic only. Uh, there are also open issues and open portfolios that, 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 that again, that it is sometimes easy to ignore or better to ignore or Israel thinks or some in Israel think that uh, they shouldn't be dealt with. Um, but I think differently. I think that courage needs to be shown. And, you know, I, I speak about it with my students and we think about the next generation of Israeli youngsters. Israel is located in the heart of the Middle East. Israel is surrounded by 400 million Arabic speakers. 
Uh, Arabic is the closest language to Hebrew in the world. And there is an ongoing conflict from 1948 and before up until 2024. If Israel stays in the Middle East, that we want and, and we want Israel to stay in the Middle East, it has to reach a different relations with its neighbors. Yeah. And I think that the imagining it happening without finding a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is, is, is an illusion. It's not going to happen. Okay. Arabic is also one of the official languages of, of Israel, and I know you you research language policy. We're, we're getting some questions about, about BGU's student population. So just for the audience, we have about 20,000 students at Ben Gurion University, two-thirds of them undergraduate, one-third graduate. About 10, a little more than 10% of our student population, a little over 2,000, are Arab Israeli. And about a third of them are actually Bedouins because the majority of Bedouins live in the South. And the majority of our Bedouin students are actually women. Um, so one of the questions, Yoni, is in your course, do you have Jews and Arabs together taking that class? Yes. And uh, it was always unique course because it, it deals with Gaza historically. So this is easier, but then it deals also with Gaza at present. And I think that the course that is going to be taught at the second semester about Gaza is going to be more unique than ever, than ever because you will have sitting in the same class students who just came back from Gaza as soldiers and Arab students whose house was bombarded by Hamas on the one hand but also who have relatives in Gaza that were killed or their house destroyed by Israeli army on the other hand. And these two communities, or these two, I don't know, the Israeli Miluimnik and the, and the Arab uh, citizen of Israel are going to sit together in the same class and study about Gaza. And we have to be very sensitive, obviously, about it and making sure, and this is what we do in our class, that we try to understand Gaza in a more nuanced and a deeper way than the one that is being covered in the media, um, in, in the Israeli media, in the Arab media, in the, in the US media and others. And we do it through especially readings that are very different from the Jewish-Israeli side to the Arab side to international scholars, but also through guest speakers. So in every course we have about seven or eight guest speakers we say to our students that we would like to listen to them and then discuss the, dif the differences between them. And the fact that we have Jewish citizens of Israel and Arab citizens of Israel who sit together and listen to an Israeli scholar or an Arab scholar or international scholar, to an NGO worker from Gaza or to a Palestinian from Gaza who used to work in Israel and is now a doctor uh, in Europe or to listen to the Israeli a defense or security establishment representative, and then to a Palestinian politician, I think gives them, or at least explains to them, or demonstrates to them, that Gaza is not a shallow question of security only, and that uh, we have to find ways not to rely only on technological security or oriented solutions if we want to enjoy real security it will have to come by dealing seriously and courageously with the questions on the table and there is an open conflict between Israelis and Palestinians it is not being solved and if it is going to be ignored or managed or administered I think sadly that it's only going to continue. We're getting some questions about the Bedouins. So uh, could you just comment on the Bedouin Arab Israelis? Are they cousins of the Gazans? And how did the events of October 7th change, if at all, the relationship with the uh, Israeli Bedouin Arab society? And is there a possibility they could help be a bridge for peace? Uh, well, October 7 is the it's like creating a, a, a tear, like um, a, that something is broken, uh, like a break within different communities. Obviously, 
between Jewish Israelis and the Arab citizens of Israel. I think also between within the Jewish community or within the Jewish uh, uh, society itself. Obviously, also between Israelis and Palestinians. It, it's a, it's an event that has repercussions and implications, and I think this would be hard to understand them in full now, when we are only after five months. Uh, the Bedouin of the Negev um, are in a way, well, obviously they are citizens of Israel, but because they are coming from a community in the south, they used to have, especially before Gaza was so closed, closed uh, closing in, so they used to have uh, different relations, family relations and social relations with Palestinians in Gaza. The most famous story, which is not a story, but uh, uh, Ismail Haniyeh, he is like a main political leader of Hamas, the head of its political office, uh, was working in Israel in the 1970s in construction. And his two sisters, the two sisters of Hamas leader, are citizens of Israel. And they live in Tel Sheva, in one of the Arab uh, Bedouin uh, cities in, in, uh, in the south. So it is more complicated than one can understand. And I think that the Arab citizens of Israel general, not only the Bedouin community, but the Arab citizens of Israel general, uh, are one of the keys to move forward in any kind of, uh, of, of of solution or resolution between Israelis and Palestinians. Sadly, if we speak about words like solution, agreement, uh, peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, a word that is hardly been hear heard, um, over the last 18 years, 20 years, we, we didn't have any of them. So there is total lack of trust between Israelis and Palestinians, Palestinians and Israelis. There is also, as I said before, almost no recognition or no meeting or no, which helps, I think, or like, and I, and I think that this also has to end. We need to find a way to imagine a different post-October 7 day. It cannot be like October 6. It's uh, October 6 and the reality that it represents does not represent security or any real status quo between Israelis and Palestinians. And we have to understand that ignoring that question is not any strategic plan. It's not a way forward. And this is what hopefully we try to do also even from Ben Gurion University. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna need to wrap up, but I got uh two more questions I want to just get to and then then we'll wrap up, Yoni. I, I can say even Doug, that if people are are, are, are either have comments about things that I said or, or feel that I should have portrayed it differently. Um, it's all very uh, short and, and I only see you. And maybe I, so I, um, especially as we all one community and, uh, and we all want to see Ben Gurion University thrives and the Negev thrives. And hopefully also one day that from the Negev there will become, there will come some of, 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 of a real peaceful promise and something better vis-a-vis -vis israeli palestinian relations so i will be happy also if you send me an email and it's very easy to Listen. catch me and uh, no, so Johnny. i'm just saying it uh, so if someone feels that i didn't touch on something or that i misrepresented uh any issues so feel free to send me an email. you did you did a wonderful job and just because we brought you in for gaza 101 doesn't mean we can't bring you back for gaza 201 um, there's a lot of education that needs to be done, both in Israel, but importantly in the U.S. on how did we get here and where do we go. So, and talk about just a second uh, where we go. Stephanie Gross asked, is it possible and what would it take? I mean, Hamas will get defeated militarily, but how do you de-radicalize a people or a society on the other side of that? Well, I think that first I'll say maybe it's easier sometimes to answer questions of what not to do. Uh, okay. Creating a huge wall in between Israel and, and, the, and the Gaza Strip and to say to the people who live there, you stay there and hoping that after 20 years they will be de-radicalized de is not an option. And the one option for de-radicalization is to, 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 to pave some kind of a vision for a different relation, different relations between Israel and Palestine, 
or Israelis and Palestinians. And I think that if Israel has something like, if you do this and that, you will get this and that, it's already a huge improvement. Imagine the fact that currently now we are being, dis we discuss and I have uh, a, a very good friend of mine, her father-in-law is being in, in Gaza for the last 150 days. And if Israel is going only to consider the release of Palestinian prisoners, I think there are more than 5,000 Palestinian prisoners in Israel. Only if uh, an, an Israeli soldier is, soldier is is being kidnapped, this is what happened with Ilhad Shalit, or 140 or 150 or 250 are being kidnapped, this is what happened in October 7. I think that this is not a good strategic thinking forward. Israel should say something if the Palestinian prisoners are such an important and core issue for the Palestinians. So we are saying that we can release this and that prisoners in return to one, two, and three, not only to react to Palestinian kidnapping Israelis. Um, sadly, I'm not so sure that Israel kind of, in a way, Israel at times found it easier uh, not to deal directly with the Palestinian issue. Uh, and I think that this should change. Last question and comes de from de Deradicalization will happen through education, but deradicalization will happen only when there is a, 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 another vision or there is somewhere to aspire to. Okay, la last question. Obviously, the Israelis and the Palestinians have not been able to speak to each other to create an effective peace agreement. Going forward, who do you think the other international players are in addition to the U.S.? What might be the role of Egypt, Jordan, other Arab countries in the region? Well, I think that the USA has always had a huge influence on Israeli foreign affairs. Uh, Israel and the USA has great alliance. Uh, one of the countries in the Middle East that is in a very good relation with the U.S. is Saudi Arabia. And there is a way forward there, meaning that if there will be some kind of a movement and Saudi Arabia will say to the Israeli side, we can uh, 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 find a way to recognize Israel, to normalize our relations with Israel, but it will have to happen with one, two, three uh, uh, steps that are going to push forward the idea of an Israeli-Palestinian peace and with the support of the USA, I think this is one important uh, uh, component. I don't think that Egypt or Jordan um, are, are, are key factors there. Um, we, we speak about big game and the big component and the USA and Saudi Arabia are definitely two really important sides. All right. Thank you, Yoni, so much for joining us. We're going to have to wrap up. For those of you who enjoyed this program, um, we have another great one coming up called Remarkable Resilience. It's our annual large virtual event. This year, it's called Remarkable Resilience, Leading the Way Forward. We're going to talk about what happened on October 7th, but also importantly, ABGU is the, the anchor institution and engine for growth and really the most vital institution for the recovery and rebuilding of the Negev, which is the recovery and rebuilding of Israel. So Wednesday, May 8th at, uh, at noon Eastern, there's a QR code. If you pick up, pick up your phones right now and take a picture of the QR code, you can register for the program um, as well as uh, sponsor it if you would like. So just click on the QR code. David Ben-Gurion, the founder and first prime minister um, and namesake for our university, of which we are very proud, had lots of quotes. I shared some of them earlier. He also said that uh, if you don't like what an expert is telling you, then you find another expert, which is kind of fun. Um, but with professors like Yonatan Mendel, Yoni, we don't have to go looking for other experts. We have plenty of them in the faculty at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. We just got to work on getting through um, on the other side of, of, of this horrible event on October 7th, and there will be brighter days ahead. Thank you, Yoni, so much for joining us. Uh, may the hostages be returned safely. May Hashem watch over the brave soldiers of the IDF. 
and may there be brighter days ahead. We know there will be. Uh, stay safe, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you for joining us.